I've had women and men separately on different occasions come up to me and said the scene that, uh, the scene of me and Renny in the bedroom they they've said that they've masturbated over me. This video should have come out 9 months ago. I'm I'm sorry kids. I uh, I had a lot of toilet problems. Marvel, Netflix, despite their unevenness, they transcended the superhero genre and into the stratosphere of well-respected highbrow productions. Luke Cage was a quintessential example. It was a powerful raw show about race in America. But then there was Iron Fist, which made everyone mad and everyone hated in America. These shows have now left Netflix for Disney Plus, which just feels very weird. It's like having one of my internal organs removed, because even when everything was cancelled, just simply seeing those thumbnails was oddly comforting. First world problem, I know. But regardless, let's celebrate their legacy. There's a mystical place called Kunla. Oh, this is a joke. My parents died in a plane crash. Leo fried his brains with methamphetamines. Einfest is often regarded as the beginning of the end of Marvel Netflix's respectability back in the day. It can look cheap, it can feel cheap, the fight scenes are infamously bad, the pacing is inappropriately slow because it feels like 6 episodes stretched to 13. And to add insult to injury, the main star, Finn Jones, is also not used correctly. In real life, he's insanely likeable. His Game of Thrones interviews single-handedly made me excited for the show, in fact. <laughs> But as Danny Rand, he's unreasonably angry and unreasonably naive, which I can kind of see where they're going with, because in the original Roy Thomas comics, he is very vengeful, but it was more written as stoic than whiny. However, and I have to stress the however part of this, it's also important to be sympathetic to the show's circumstances. When Marvel Television, which was a separate division at the time, licensed these characters for the purpose of creating mature urban crime dramas, it made sense for everyone but Iron Fist, a martial arts fantasy hero. Therefore, with no clear workable vision, it entered development hell. Would it be a standalone streaming film, shortened season, Axel Braun directed porn parody? Therefore, as Defenders loomed closer and Jeff Loeb insisted on Iron Fist coming out before, Scott Buck was brought on board so late into production that Finn Jones and Jessica Henwick was casted a month before filming. Fuck hell, man. So I, I was cast in February and then we started shooting in March. So I had a very small window to <laughs> get proficient. Month. Which is why everyone was so ill prepared for the choreography. All of the show's incompetent issues are pretty much the byproduct of the most undesirable circumstances ever. Thank you, Jeff cool. Lope. Thank you very much. But now I'm going to lose even more credibility than usual. I don't hate Iron Fist Season 1. Because I'm very charmed by it. It's like watching your friend's dad accidentally destroy your car because he wants to show off his mad mechanical skills. It sucks that your car is destroyed, but the effort yields its own entertainment. Iron Fist Season 1 has a very strange homemade amateurish quality to it because it's always outstretching beyond its limits. From doing a full Game of Death Kung Fu episode with RZA to the attempt at being globe trotting, even though China is very clearly just an alley somewhere in America, and all the actors are acting their little hearts out even though the writing very, rarely, very, rarely matches up to them. And I say rarely because there's an actual nice story here that is actually good, but it's decompressed to oblivion. We begin with Danny Rand as a barefoot monk returning to New York to reclaim his identity as the heir to his family's OnlyFans account. He gets thrown into a mental institute, escapes, wins a legal battle, falls in love with a cool martial arts teacher, then discovers she and her community of weird millennial hippies are actually the hand who he's destined to destroy. I am the Iron Fist, protector of Kanlan Swan. An enemy of the hand. Afterwards, his brother from another mother, Davos from Kunlun, who for some reason has a British accent, the abundant Kunlun, arrives for him. But Rand has changed from all his experiences. So when they come to blows out of jealousy, in the end, Danny and Colleen defeats the hand. They return to Kunlun, but it's gone. He's too late. What? You know, after 15 years, he realizes that he can leave, and he is wrought with trauma and anxiety and he just really needs to kind of claim back his identity he needs to find out what happened to his parents he, he needs to claim back who danny rand was it, and kind of like disregarding his responsibility as the iron fist and as we'll see as the show progresses that gets him in a lot of trouble you know he's like every 25 year old they've just left kind of childhood but mm -hmm. they're not quite an adult yet and you can feel quite lost in those in that transition and i think danny's going through that but it's just 
amplified because he is the Iron Fist and because you know he's had this trauma. And, and he, he is a billionaire. Yeah, and, and really the money isn't the money means nothing to Danny. He needs his name back. That's that's why he's pursuing his company. You know he's been neglected and traumatized and forgotten for 15 years in a remote place where no one understands him. And so him coming back to try and claim his company back isn't about him claiming back or becoming a billionaire. That means nothing to him. It's about claiming his identity back. And actually what we find out is when he does get his identity back, he's still lost, he's still alone. And we're asking these questions of what makes someone whole? You know, what is it that makes someone feel like they've got drive and purpose? Iron Fist is effectively about people lost because of unhealed wounds from their childhood abuse and therefore struggle to see themselves as they are, not just as victims of someone else's actions. Ward, Danny's childhood friend and sort of antagonist, was abused by his father. Davos was abused by the pressures of his mother to become the Iron Fist. Danny was abused by his training and his repression of his trauma. It's like a, a fire burning inside of me. I am Danny Rand. I don't care what you think. And every time it happens, it gets harder and harder to control. Colleen was brainwashed by Bakudo. Everyone must carve their own paths, but finding that independence doesn't come free. It's a painful journey that requires relinquishing and admitting that you are more than one thing. But I'm Danny Rand, and I'm the Iron Fist. It's a nice story, you know? I, I like it. I find it sweet. The Defenders takes this idea and brings it to its most natural conclusion. Danny has reclaimed his name and is more whole now, but he has no home. He is the Iron Fist and he is Danny Rand, but Iron Fist is supposed to fucking defend Kunlun. But with no Kunlun, what is he gonna defend? Your mom. Danny then goes through a life-changing journey as he examines his privileges with Luke. You never fought someone to protect someone else? Of course I have. Okay, so what's the difference? The difference is I live on their block. He's excited to find his place among those like him. We make quite a team. Well, let's not use that word. Commits to his love with Colleen and inherits Matt's role as New York's protector. He said protect my city. He accepts a new home and defends it as the Iron Fist. New York, starting to feel like home. Therefore restoring this formerly destroyed continuity in himself. Defenders in general is very meh, but the Iron Fist portion is actually pretty solid because he has a fulfilling arc. And also granted he benefits from being a plot device too, so the show never awkwardly finds reasons for him to stick around, unlike for Jessica Jones. And also Finn Jones' performance is instantaneously way better now, because his natural charisma is actually used. So the whole group is perfectly rounded. Got someone charming, someone sarcastic, someone inspirational, and someone chill unless he gets pointlessly angry because the writers needed a fight scene. Season 2 attempts to refresh and salvage the show's reputation. Its main selling point was that the fight scenes would be f***ing awesome because the choreographer from Black Panther was involved. I'm Clayton Barber. Which is cool, but at the same time, this brawl style kind of undermines the whole kung fu genre aesthetic. Wouldn't it make more sense to bring in Hong Kong choreographers and actually give them more than an afternoon to plan it? Furthermore, the overarching themes and focus moved. So it's no longer about a kid reclaiming his identity or finding his home, but it's more of a coming of age tale about two lovers discovering themselves and two brothers at war. All of my attention is focused on protecting this city. And where were you when our city needed protecting? Danny. Love is the central pattern for everything. Colleen and Danny are now in a committed relationship. Her old dojo, where her hand students used to be taught, is now their New York love pad. How about one last heroic mission before we get some shut eye? Danny is a vigilante, like Daredevil, but there's an anger inside him that's unresolved. Davos forms his own school of street delinquents, steals Danny's power after wanting it for the longest time, but fails to know what to do with it afterwards. This war between the triads, I ended it in a single day. No, you didn't. You just became another faction in the conflict. Joy Meacham tries to steer him towards goodness, but can't get past his narcissism, his unwillingness to let go. You stole the fist from him. You stole it. I mean, it makes sense that you hang out with a bunch of teenagers. Typhoid Mary is also introduced, who suffers from dissociative identity disorder. How long does it last? The switch? Hours, days. She's recovering from trauma herself. However, there's also an emerging new identity that she doesn't know anything about 
that's coming. The point is, all the characters are trying to settle an identity, but are failing because it's not entirely fulfilling. The truth is that they've got to form new ones, new identities, and the only way to do that is to let go of what they want. I think that she's going through a bit of an identity crisis. She has uh, removed everything from her life that reminds her of the hand, which means she shut down her dojo, she stopped teaching, she stopped fighting, she's not going to the club anymore. She put a kitchen in there, some mid-century furniture. She put a kitchen oh. in and she spends her time doing volunteer work. So she's, yeah, having a little bit of a, an identity crisis. Colleen trains Danny overnight, so he can beat up Davos without the Iron Fist, which is really weird and makes very little sense, but the point is, her identity crisis is resolved. She knew what she didn't want to be, but didn't have an answer on who to become until now. She becomes the Iron Fist. Danny leaves in search of Orson Randall. Ward joins him and lets everything go after his relationship issues totally broke down. You already know who you are. Why don't you find out who you could be? Uh, it's irresponsible. You can't just help and leave. You can't run away from yourself. Maybe you'd be running towards yourself. What does that even mean? What does it mean to you? Now stop it. Don't zen con me. Don't make light of it. It's a real thing. I know it is. This was a season about looking at yourself. Now that your story has been fully written, it's not time to forcefully extend another chapter, but to start a new book. Working here isn't enough. There are people and they need help and they're out there. Season 2 is alright, it's objectively better by many metrics, from a shorter episode run, therefore better pacing, better fight scenes, and Danny is way more likeable. But it's also way more conservatively made, therefore it loses a lot of the homemade and futile quality that I found really charming from before. There's also this really horrible bright green text that appears in the intro now, and whenever the writing has an opportunity to really confront a deep topic, it often runs away rather than confront them. You've never had a heritage of your own, a culture you must honour. And protect. Stop validating your actions, Davos. Which makes me kind of perplexed over why it was even brought up in the first place. Anyways, it ends on a very promising finale where anything can be done. And then cancelled! Brilliant. From troubled production to cancelled with a cliffhanger, out of all the fucking Marvel Netflix productions, Danny really got the short end of the stick. But regardless, his story should be remembered as one of a boy who shows us that leaving home to discover yourself is an exercise that should happen at least once a couple of years, apparently. You can call it maintenance. I want to be worthy of the Iron Fist, but until I truly know what I stand for, I can't trust myself with that responsibility. So, with Shang-Chi as the new resident MCU Kung Fu representative and a new Iron Fist in the comics, I think it's safe to say the tale of Danny Rand is over. I think it'd be cool if they just made Colleen Wing the new resident Iron Fist by default and make Danny Rand her sidekick. It basically happened by the end of season 2, it'd continue the story, settle the political controversy, and Jessica Henwick is widely considered the best actor in the show. If Matt Murdock can come back, then why not Iron Fist? Probably because everyone makes fun of him. You would kick me in the balls every chance you had. Well, with videos like this, I'm glad I've got an Epidemic Sound subscription. Although thanks to British Gas, I probably won't anymore. Luke Cage's story begins not in his own show, but in Jessica Jones, as a bartender who she casually has dalliances with. However, everything disastrously falls apart. She killed his wife originally. Luke loses his bar. The only thing I have left of Reva was inside those four walls. And is mind controlled into forgiving Jess, resulting in a fight where he gets shotgunned in the face. As a result, he runs away from everything. This is where his show begins. Luke hiding at home back in Harlem. A fresh new beginning for a show that's all about escaping the past. Ironic, isn't it? Luke Cage is a f***ing awesome show with a very strong, vibrant flavour, from music, raw political topics, and a neo-blaxploitation charm. Showrunner Chio Coker's goal was to create an experience comparable to the Y in terms of full immersion into a whole culture. However, its biggest and most obviously weird misstep is its weird structure. Season 1 is split into two halves, with two different villains and priorities. The first with Mahasha Ali as Cottonmouth, who's f amazing by the way, is focused on the history of the streets. Everyone in Harlem has inherited the collective painful past of a disadvantaged neighbourhood, where everyone remembers the tragedies but can't imagine a future beyond them, or even any broader historical context for their own identities. Cottonmouth was coerced into a life of crime, while his sister Mariah was given the privilege of an education. Uh-uh, not you. 
stay right there, Cornel. But Pops' barbershop becomes a popular place of hope because Pop himself is a symbol of redemption, someone old school who turns his life around. So when he dies due to violence from the streets, the entire neighborhood has been shook to the core and Luke must come out of the shadows to preserve and carry on his legacy, which then sparks a gigantic social change. The second half is more focused on the history of a man. Luke himself is a man escaping his past as Carl Lucas, an ex-con arrested for a crime he didn't commit and was experimented on. His prison psychiatrist and eventually dead wife, Reva, helped him escape, but she also spied on him for a whole secret operation, which A, retcons her importance, so Luke's crazier bachelor activities can be more permissible? I don't know. And B, Luke has more permission to let go of his nostalgia because he accepts his memories aren't containers of truth but are an impression of a reality that should serve us to look forward to the future. Or as he said, I don't think I really knew her at all. I still love her. I love the idea of Reva, but not her specifically. This line applies to everything. The idea of people and the hope that they can create is more important than who they really are because only through the hope they bring is it possible to live beyond the painful past and move forward. And that's what Pops gave Luke and what Luke gives to Harlem. By protecting his legacy and standing up for the little guy as an incorruptible, indestructible force, this allows people to imagine something beyond the past. This brings me to also one of my favorite bits in the entire show. Luke is framed for killing a copper and with everyone having Judas bullets, which directly bypasses his indestructible skin, he's like any other black dude targeted by authority. But through Method Man and the solidarity of the streets, Luke is covered. He also has to fight his brother Willis, who shows up in a ridiculous polystyrene Robocop cosplay to get beaten up as the crowd cheers on. It's f***ing ridiculous. But there's enough of a base level of cheese where that kind of allows this weird sh** to work. Although killing Cottonmouth for this seems like a really stupid trade in hindsight. But Marshall Lee is coming back as Blade, so I guess it worked out. As a whole, the two halves create a tone of Chiroscuru. The first half seems lighter, while the second is darker. But to Together, they give depth to the central message, which is learning to live with painful paths is about looking forwards, always forwards. And that requires hope, hope for redemption. When season one ended, Luke gets sent to fuck prison and his new girlfriend, Claire, says she knows a good lawyer. So when we pick this up in the Defenders, he's already leaving prison. Foggy used the evidence off screen and I cannot express how brutally disappointed I was back in the day. I spent a whole fucking year losing sleep over excitement over how Matt Murdock is going to be there in some sort of awesome court sequence. But nah, uh, he defends some other kid and Luke gets one line from Foggy. Regardless, Luke is back at it again and is sent on a mission to aid the local community again. A kid who gets tangled with the hand, which Danny is beating up. As a result, as eventual bros, they eventually teach each other new things about life and stuff. Danny is taught to think about the impact of his wealth and privileges. Luke is taught to look past it while opens up so he's less alone. Luke Cage is also cool with Jessica, but he never discloses the Reva retcon, which is weird, but regardless, there's still a spark between them, and I wish I lived in a universe where these shows never got cancelled so we can f***ing get to the pulse already. In conclusion, Luke Cage has the f***ing least to do in The Defenders, largely because his own mythology is so widely disconnected. He's just a solid guy who's there to provide some muscle, and a more clear moral viewpoint, which is then dismissed when he's outvoted on blowing up the building at the end very strange. But ironically, this explosion is the last hurrah of Luke as a hero, because what comes next is the end. Things get very muddy. Season 2 is about the last violent gasp of a simpler world before it's corrupted by a new balance of power, or as Shades puts it, The whole rules are being broken. Everything is changing for the worse. You started that when you and Tone shot this place up and killed Pop. It begins with Luke at the height of his powers, physically and socially. But he's also changing for the worst as his anger is burning inside him. It's buried and unrealized. He even pushes Claire away, which for the entirety of the Netflix verse, she's been a reliable moral actor in everyone's tale. She regularly patched Matt up. She helped Jessica patch Luke up. She was a sincere helping hand for Danny's mission. And when Luke fell in love with her, it was a declaration of his freedom to move on, to live for a future, to get over the past. But now there's a deep level of loneliness inside him that he hasn't even resolved yet. 
and has turned into impotence, all because of the pressure from people around him and his relationship with his father. Some of the better parts are from you too. Swagger. You goddamn right. This also leads to the best 40 minutes ever when Danny shows up in a guest appearance in the main ingredient for a Heroes for Hire style adventure. Their journeys have now led to a point where they've kind of swapped places. Luke is the one with so much anger that he can't move. You're off balance because you're angry. Hell yeah, I'm angry. About what? And Danny is the one who's calming him down and mentoring him about his relationship with his environment. But within the episode, as they chase Bushmaster who's out for revenge, Luke also acts more oh, like a thug. Yeah. Oops. A deliberate symmetry is formed as he ends up doing her dirty work. You better find Bushmaster before I do. Like her, he's fallen in love with his own idea, his own symbol. A name he once used to escape to has become a superpower itself. It's become a seductive force. Stillness is power? No. Money is power. Therefore, when Mariah is finally defeated, Luke slips into her place as the new person in charge of Harlem, holding both the law and the lawless close to heart. The ending is ambiguous, but also kind of not. D-Dub kicks Luke Cage out of the barbershop with a reference to Donald Trump, which is very, very strange because the MCU has its own mythology of fictional presidents. Who Trump? Before its cancellation, the final image was our hero slowly standing above his desk, the place where his enemies once stood as his father's words loom over him like a shadow. This is when the magic happens. On one hand, it totally sucks that the story was left unfinished. In fact, plans were fucking on the way for a shorter season three, but due to disagreements and costs, it was canceled even before the Netflix Marvel Red Wedding. However, if we view the entire story through the lens of this singular final moment, it kind of fits thematically. This was a story about a local hero inspiring those around him, but also rising to the top and trapped there. A tragedy where moving forwards can also lead to moving too far. But maybe it is from surviving under this pressure, there's a higher place of enlightenment, a bigger moral responsibility. And if the show has taught us anything, we should hope. Luke Cage also does make a cameo in Jessica Jones season 3, which foreshadows the dark days ahead, where even Jessica Jones has risen higher than him in terms of moral confidence. But in his eyes, when he asks her to look after him, if he needs to be knocked down, eventually... If I ever go too far, I hope that someone gives enough of a shit about me to take me down. The soul, the reluctance, the pain, we know. He's a good man. He's still the same man from the very start. There is light at the end of the tunnel. And maybe that's enough. And right now, I guess, that's just enough for me. Well, with these shows now on Disney+, Plus, the MCU has unofficially officiated these shows into its internal mythology, because the original Netflix contract prohibited any crossovers for two years, and since Kevin Foggy and crew didn't have any involvement, it kind of meant that these shows were in a shrug worthy, maybe it's canon, maybe it's not, but with Charlie Cox back, it's now a good shrug instead of a bad one. If Luke Cage is to return, he's easily the most difficult to re-establish, because either you have to commit to completing his tale from before, which I don't really they think Kevin Feige and crew would care too much about because they didn't have a hand in writing it, or they can take advantage of the real life passing of four years to ignore everything and completely reinvent him from the ground up as a street level hero again. So we'll probably have some sort of obligatory monologue where he mentions being in charge of Harlem's paradise and letting her go and times change, you know, it's all retcon. I personally would prefer the former, but regardless, let's just celebrate how lucky we were to even have this show. I love you, Luke Cage. Come back to me, please. But I do hope that these shows aren't just remembered as being cool, violent, dark shows about miserable, attractive people fighting in the streets, but remember them for their ambitions. To tell a no-budget tale about lost people overcoming abuse, a politically charged examination of power, and the overall desire to look at superheroes with a completely unflattering lens, despite not using household names. These shows are art, and they deserve to be remembered as such. Look, I know what it's like to spend your whole life believing in something and have it pulled away. But we have to stop fighting. We have to stop running. I will make you proud. I will make you proud. You have no idea 
what I spared you. I'm not joy. There were so many times that I wanted to tell you I would literally pack a bag. The darkness that you deal with every day, that people disconnect you from their soul. I kind of work it, make you angry. It can consume your whole if you let it. You can't just not snitch or turn away or take money under the table because life has turned you sour. When did people stop caring? Look how happy they seem. Sometimes when our own lives are a struggle, it's easier to imagine we belong to some other world. The past is the past. The only direction in life that matters is forward, never backwards. But this is the reason why I need to step away. Okay, you're overreacting, Danny. You made mistakes. You can learn from them. And I intend to. But I can't but I do can't that do if that I'm, holding I'm holding the fist. The fist. Fist slash Luke Cage essay. They were originally supposed to be two different separate videos, but barely anyone was interested in the Punisher one, and I was really adamant that I finished this entire stuff off. So here it is, I just decided to merge them into one big video and treated everything as a massive big farewell to the MCU Marvel Netflix era. This also kind of marks as an end for this channel. MCU content has shaped implicitly pretentious, like a hand cupping my balls, and these Marvel Netflix shows has been the fingers I've always been very, very slowly counting once it's done. And since it's all done, all the fingers are gone, I am now free to move on with my life and do other stuff. Which now means in Eternals and Shang-Chi video. Ah, it's not that different after all. Amazing! <laughs> I can't wait! It's out tomorrow! It's so out tomorrow? Yes, it's out tomorrow. We're doing it so we can get everything here, right? 